So thirteenth halacha, uh, what you're talking about, yeah. You want to have, you can't have a uh, wine and oil that's already become bad. And uh, we said that the gizbar would check the the solet if it raised up some really real kemachi things. Kemach is ground finely that's like a powder. It's dusty and it you know raised up by it actually gets blown in in, in the wind, right? You have someone play with with flour in the in the house. Kids you know, make uh, recipes, and the flour gets everywhere. But if you're using solet, solet is much coarser, so it doesn't doesn't get into the air. It's not like a dust that can be spread. People said that they live across the from the tahana. Modern Hebrew has two words: a tahana with a tuff. The tuff is not part of the shoresh. It's from the word chone, like a station. So a, a bus station is called a tahana. And if it's just a bus stop, it's a tahana. Okay, that's so the tuff. And then there's a Tahana with a tet for the word a mill with kon. Mm-hmm. So they have a gigantic miller uh, mill right there in Givat Shaul at the entrance of Givat Shaul along Farbstein Street. You know where Farbstein Street is? It's uh whatever it's uh it's off of Givat Shaul. It connects from Givat Shaul to Beit Fus and then it continues on the curve all the way to uh, Herzl Street. Okay, Farbstein. It basically envelopes Givat Shaul. Uh, What's the city? Kiryat Moshe on the west. It's a long, it's a north-south stream in Jerusalem, and it goes downhill from Givat Shaul. So on Farbstein Street, there is uh, the Angel Bakery and their mill, the place where they actually make the flour. And people live in the apartment complexes across the street. Their houses are extra dusty. They say, you leave your windows facing the, the, the angel uh, plant across the street. You leave the windows open so your house will get coated in dust. Flour. So they're 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 doing a real intense milling over there. That's where they, they they create the flour. So you have to watch out for that. So that's what this halacha is ripping. I didn't put it on the screen. I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, we're up to we're going to read this halacha gimel. Itim shelikatan migelalei habakar. Oh boy, this is imagine like during the time of famine. It says in the Bible once, and there's a gemara about this. Where do they find grain? You know, you look through the 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 droppings from the from the behemoths. Okay, so it's it so happens that if this cow doesn't chew the wheat properly, whole kernels will just pass through. And you could take those out and you could plant them. It says chitim that came out of that a person picked out of animal dung. That's Galilee bakar uzraam, and I have and here it's with a nun. By the way, that mivkar and, and muvkar and nivkar. And so on, sometimes what do you have? Is it is it Muvkar or Nivkar? In Rav Kapach, it's just Muvkar, not Nivkar. Okay. Hare elu safekim of Aram Yusatan Bizriah. It's a safek if the 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 disgust that one should have for these things has been removed by the fact that they're planted. You take these these grains out of the animal dung and plant them, don't put them in the dirt. You know, eventually it will sprout into wheat. So you have wheat. By the way, you fertilize the wheat with dung. So it's not like you know a few a few months after the rains fall and everything it's already back into earth, but still the fact is that you know that these grains, the seeds for these grains, mm-hmm. came out of the animal dung. It, it it is it considered like I guess uh, removed, so that's not disgusting. And meus, by the way, is the opposite of the verb here. The shorish mem aleph samich throughout the Torah is the opposite of bet chet resh. Okay, they're opposites, polar opposites. So it says that God chose someone as a king. And like Samuel, uh, Saul, and then God rejected him, Ma'as. And the Navi says, I'm a Nifkar, that's us, we're God's chosen people. Ki ma'os ma'as tanu, have you rejected us? And it says about Jerusalem, that's more destruction, God rejects it, chosen city, Bacharti Bayer. says, no, Ma'asti. Okay? And there's a, throughout the Torah, used, Mius and Bechira are polar opposites and used as opposites, just like up and down. Sometimes they don't have perfect words that are opposites, but this is one of those cases. Or Dayan Haim Musim. That's why the Ram began with things have to be Nivchar, Muvchar. So these are not. So it's a suffix. Don't bring meal offerings to the temple from these types of grains. We have a V kosher, but if you did bring their kosher, as the Ram Kedark Bakodish, whenever he has such a suffix, the Khatila no, but after the fact, yes. Here's the oils that are puzzled. Shemen shell gargarim shenasharu she nishabru, right? They say uh, nishiru, nasharu. I don't have dots here. Nasharu means they they were soaked, that they soaked. Nishiru is a is a nifal. The nun that's there 
is the nifal nun, and the nun of the shoresh is absorbed into the shin. So the shin has a dot. Nishiru. Yeah, you see? Dogish in the shin. Oh, well, I guess you know. So I got that wrong. That's why I would have dotted it. No, the only, the only dot in the letter is the nun. Oh, so no, so this means to nishru. So it's strange. Oh, oh no, no, no. There's no there's no nun in the shoresh. That's why. The shoresh is shruya, shin resh hey. Okay. I'm so that, wrong about that. that. that so sense. Okay, that, that that should be yeah. Okay. okay. Now, nishru means they they it's a it's an active. So nishru is a perfect nifal and there's no nun missing. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we should have taken that talent all beforehand. Okay. Oh shall zasim kavushim. That means that why would you soak an olive in, in water though? What happens when you soak any vegetable or fruit in the water? It plumps it back up. Okay. So that's what they thought they could do. Of course, you don't want to plump an olive in with water because an olive is, is supposed to have oil in it. Plumping up your olive artificially with water isn't going to increase its oil content. It's just going to make it look like that. Oh, shell zesim kvushim, pickled olives. Oh, shlukim, they're cooked olives. Oh, shell shemen shel shmarim. Where are the shmarim? When you make wine, the shmarim are the, oh, what do they call it? All the, the, the seeds and the, and the skins that are left at the bottom. Okay. So in this case, when they would make olive oil, there's a lot of leftovers at the bottom of the press. So oil that drips out of that. O shemen sherecho ra. What? Yeah, the dregs, that's wine. So they call it dregs of olive oil. Would that be a proper translation? Shemen sherecho ra. Oil that has a bad smell. Kol el psulin. While shemen zayit. What do you have here? Oh, they planted it. Uh, he planted it. The, oil, the, the tree. Okay. Shemen zayit. Of a shemen of the zayat, okay, doesn't mean shemen zayat. Of a shemen of a zayat, that's an olive tree that had been planted, or they had he had planted it in the basis of all, and that means a place that needs to be fertilized all the time. Obvious a shilhin, we set a place the way the way they have to irrigate it properly. Ocean nizra zera benihem, or once again, like with a grapevine, there's some sort of other plant that they're growing there. There are vegetables in between the the olive trees. O shemen shehotzi o, right? You got that? Hotzi o, not hotzi. Hotzi o means a theme. Shelo bashelu, okay? From olives that had not ripened. Eladain hein pagin, unripe ones. They're still small. Pag is uh, nowadays they quote what's a pagia? That's a place in the hospital they keep tra- they 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 take care of the preemie babies. Like a pag is you know preemie. Kol elu lo yavi. He shouldn't bring those. Shouldn't bring those as olive oil to the temple. Vim hevi kosher, and if he did, it's kosher. All the meal offerings and the wine offerings, and by the way, is including the olive oil, it could come from within the land of Israel or outside the land of Israel. You have really fine oil from some other place, uh, some other country that could also be used. Mina chadash, mina yashan, whether from the new crop or the old crop, right? Uvavad sheaviu mina mifbar. He's not talking about here Kaddish and Yasin because there's an actual halacha that you are only supposed to bring menachos from the new crop after a certain point in the in the year, after you know Pesach, right? When you bring the Omer. He means, just like I think he means that new, you know, uh, vintage, something that's been in the Machsan for a while or not. There are some certain standards. How long it's, it's how old is too old already? But it seems that perhaps even if something is technically old, but it's very high quality, it could still be used. It just has to be the choicest kind. What do you have? Mubchar and Nibchar. Uh, yeah. So here, Koran agrees with me. Could be this year's uh, crop or last year's crop. Refies, applies to fruit also. It's lavdafka to grain. And uh, it says here. The Omer is Lechem. All right, we said those are what are those? Those are the Passover Omer. On the Omer, you can only have to bring from this year's crop, and also the Shtelechem on Shavuos has to be that year's crop of, of wheat that's called Bikurim. Right, you can't use older wheat that you had in the Machsan, even if it's fine wheat, because these specifically have to come from the new crop. And uh, does the new does the prohibition of eating new grain uh, apply in Chutzlaritz? Yashan and Chutzlaritz. So many purists say that, yes, it applies, just like it does apply in the land of Israel. So you have grain products 
they only become permissible after Passover, all right? So the let's say the spaghetti you or if it's made from uh, grains from Italy and from the United States, so if it hasn't been passed, let's say already in, in February and March, they have the new grain crop and products made from the new grain crop, those are chadash still. It's only going to be sometime after Passover we have the kind that they'll become permissible. So there are many machmir for such a thing in Chutzlar. So have you heard about it? Sir Rabbeim talk about it. And the general practice is not to be machmir. Why? Historically speaking, because it was almost impossible to do so. You needed to eat the new crop. So there's a uh, Shon Machronim who justifies such a thing. It's, it's kind of weak. I know uh, our Rabbi Salvechik was machmir for eating Yashon it's, it's picking up because it's more doable. Uh, I don't know. Rabbi Rahim would say his opinion. I think he also says that. I don't know. Well, we'll see. Maybe someone has in the Q&A what he said. Okay, here's uh, Yisuri Mizbeach. Last parrot. Ooh, let's get into this one. So we're going to see that the Rambam is going to conclude this with some muster. Maybe we could finish this all tonight. Just because uh, something is not disqualified doesn't mean you should bring it with Chachila. Right? Makes sense. Just because you can doesn't mean, doesn't mean you should. Ketzad. Haya chayav ola. He has to bring, he's obligated to bring a burnt offering to the temple. So we shouldn't bring some weak looking sheep or an ugly one. Okay, Just whatever sheep comes out of the pen. Look at it. It's flawless. And there's no moon. I learned the Rambam, Hilchus Yisuri Mizbeach, and also Hilchus Vias Mikdash. And I saw, I went through all the entire list of moon. And this, this uh, sheep is, is blemish free. But still, there's much nicer looking ones. Okay. Cursed is this nochel. I guess nochel is a person who's trying to get away with something. I'm looking the other way. Uh, this is from Malachi. Malachi is a small book of the of the Torah, of the Tanakh. At the beginning, he was criticizing the early Second Temple people who were not machmir for bringing proper korbanos to the temple. He says, uh, bring it to the to your governor as a tribute. Will he accept it? So why do you bring this to the temple? Okay. You should bring the choicest ones. I think everybody has the word mufkar there, right? Here's what they used to do in the times of the temple. At least they would try to bring rams from Moab. Uh, in English, a ram means an adult sheep. An adult lamb, male, glorious has horns. It's full grown. Halakhically speaking, that's true. But more specifically, the line between ram and just a lamb is a year old. Okay? So you could say that this sheep is an early bloomer. Already, he already has horns and all that. He looks like a ram. Let's say he's fully grown. He looks like a ram. No, but he hasn't hit his birthday. So he's not a ram. And the hefich, you could say, well, he has no horns yet. It doesn't look fully grown, but he's well over a year old. He's Halakhli Aram. Okay? It's, it's, an, it's an actual defined line. The, the English word we use doesn't define it. Like, when does, when does, a, when does a cow stop being a calf? So we're going to see in Maisa Karbanos, there's an actual halakhic line. Okay, but, you know, like Rav Shekhti says, the world's tallest midget, you know. You bring these kvasim, uh, these sheep, that have wide wide behinds, you get them from the Hebron area. By the way, Moab doesn't mean necessarily the country, it means like the eastern part, the southern Transjordan. We would bring, uh, these are calves from the Sharon, that's uh, the coastline, okay, the northern coast. We'd bring, uh, these are uh, the young uh, B'nai Yonah, young uh, turtle doves. Where would they get them from? Har HaMelech. Where is Har HaMelech? I don't know. I knew, I knew once upon a time. Levin Yayin Mi Kruchin V'Chalutin. Or Chalutayin. Kruchayin and Chalutayin, wherever those are. That's where they find the best wine, land of Israel. Soleth from Michmash and Yochana. Where is Michmash? Just down the road. It's around here. Okay. Levin Shemen Mi Oil from Tekoa. That's also somewhere down here. Even though land of Usher up north is left with olive oil. They found out the best oil for the temple comes from actually a place in the land of Yehuda. that's in the Gush, the Tekoa. Okay. So this is the 
Well, oh, it's not the Tekoa? Oh, oh, so he says it. It's it's the it, that that makes more sense. It's Asher's Tekoa. That's the land where where they have better olive oil. Okay, very good. Who says that? Machbili says uh, that. Yes. And who does he quote? No, no, he doesn't attribute it to anybody. Okay. You have new wood, uh, so I guess it's kosher for the temple. It means that unused wood. Remember we saw last week, uh, uh, Atze Stira, they took apart the, the roof. They took apart some structure that had been standing for a while. They took apart the deck. It has been it was a 30-year-old deck. He didn't he didn't apply the right type of water sealant. So now the taking apart the deck, the wood's not usable for anything. So we said that they're going to call them Atze Lagba Omer here in Israel. So atzik eitzim hachadashim k'sherem l'amrach means the unused wood, new wood. In the olden days, they didn't apply. Not every wood used, by the way, for construction should be used for fire nowadays. Why? Even though burning wood isn't exactly clean by our standards, you know, all sorts of, you know, fossil fuels are much burned cleaner, ironically, than burning wood. Wood is very dirty stuff to burn. But nowadays, the wood that we have is even worse. Why? Because we treat it with all sorts of chemicals. And my carpenter friend likes to point out, you don't want one of these terrible Lagba Omer fires. They put everything, they put everything into the wood. You know? So that, that wood is not clean to burn. You don't want someone taking an old couch and burning it. Mm -hmm. So then if there might be plastics and other things in there, but it's just the wood itself is treated. In the olden days, they did not treat wood with chemicals like we do. Mm -hmm. So at least it was, you know, natural. Michel Zayat, but they did not take wood from olive trees. They wouldn't use olive wood for the temple. For burning in the temple. Michel Geffen, or grapevine wood. Why? Mishu Mishu Varit Israel. Because you want to keep Varit Israel settled. If you're chopping down the most important fruit trees for wood, so that's pretty bad. You, you, you use the eucalyptus. Eucalyptus wasn't here back then, but now there are some. So there are places where all they have is eucalyptus. Why did they bring the eucalyptus into the land of Israel? It's invasive, it takes over places. Why are they bring the eucalyptus? To drain swamps. Mm. He drinks up the water, so you know. Oh, that's good, but that's what he needed at the time. But you know, perhaps uh, maybe it's not. So now you should use eucalyptus, which is it's srach srach. Maybe it doesn't give fruit. Better to use that as the wood. Okay. Here's what they used to do. Here's where you used to get the wood. Murbiot shel teina shel choreshin sheinan by yeshu. Murbiot of teina means they cut off branches of the fig trees. Okay, and it means younger ones. Uh, so that doesn't really harm the harm the land because the fig tree is growing new new branches all the time. Those aren't the good branches that give the fruit. And also he says that's Anun by Yeshuv. Okay. Uvashel it goes. Uvashel eats semen or the walnut branches. I prune my walnut tree. I've you've seen it. So I have to prune it every year before Shavuos. No biggie. It, it grows them back. There's it gets plenty. You could use that as chach and uh it's not a thing. And what's eight shemen? Uh, so that's an, that's a wood that's type of oil, that's kind of oily. I think it's cedar wood. Okay, cedar wood has a particular oil in it. Lagzarin she asa Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu himself needed wood for his own, you know, for the the mizbeach that we read about in this week's parsha. So these uh, branches, where they come from, ama arkan v'ama rochban. They were uh, an ama wide and an uh, and an ama long. Okay, that's so why he stacked them up. These bundles of sticks. The thickness was, okay, thickness, just the, the branch. What's a machak? Not an eraser nowadays. You have to take a stick or something to measure off the se'ah flour. So you put in the cup and then you flatten the cup with the machak. So that stick had a certain thickness. I guess it was a standard thing, like a ruler. Uh, and it says, And that's how we do from, you know, forever. Try to build fires this the way the Zorin, the bundles of sticks, do it like Moshe Rabbeinu did of a certain ovi. So what is that? Does anybody have a thing? How thick was this thing? I don't know. We said an almost is basically a foot and a half or 48 uh, centimeters. Okay. Uh, next. How did they plant the seeds for the Menachos and the Nesachim? How they used to do this? They would plow half the field in the first year. This is a real chetzio, and the other half they planted that year. It's a wheat field. The second year they would plow the half that had been 
planted the previous year. And they would plant the half that had been plowed the previous year, switching off two field system. Okay. And they do this 70 days before Passover. What day is 70 days before Passover? Basically the 20th of Shvat. Sorry, no, not the 20th of Shvat. 70 days before Passover. A month is Purim plus 40 days. It's about the 5th of Shvat or so. Okay. And if there's a, how would, but maybe there's an other Shani. The answer is yes. They'd usually announce there were supposed to be two others when around Rosh Hashanah time. So they knew well in advance where when you know when there's an other Shani. It was a rare thing that they'd have to institute an other Shani last minute or sometime. You know, they realized things are going on. They calculated well in advance, and that was the usual thing. Other Shani was announced already uh, at uh, at Tishrei time. Okay. Um, well, yeah. It would be in, in Adar Rishon. What does that mean? Not Avuda, not like work. It means Avuda, it means it wasn't worked. If the field hadn't been worked, Koresh Vishoneh, let's say then plant advance. They are doing this whole thing one year plowing half this half and plant the other half back and forth. Koresh Vishoneh. So he would double plow it. Then he would, then he would plant. And this is pretty good. You know, you have to let the land lie fallow in order to get good crops. So basically, this is a high standard. Imagine letting the land lie fallow every other year. Even the three field system, when, uh, they had like fallow every every third year, whatever it is. How often does Torah say you should let the land lie fallow? Minimum one in seven. Shemitah. He should check the and the go and uh, I guess sift. Okay, try to try to take out all the impurities from these wheat. Very well. What does shaf mean? Shaf means he's like pressing down on them. I think it talks about, you guys have a, a picture there, what he's doing with his hand and the foot, right? Yeah. We don't have the pictures. Okay. And he kicks them. There are those who say, does he mean with the rego? See the Makbili picture. And everybody says the Rama means bo'eit. Bo'eit means with, with, the, you know, with the foot. It means you use your foot. Kick them a lot. Adshit kaplu. Yeah, yit kalfu. Sorry, yit kalfu. Yit kapalu means they fold over. Yit kalfu means until their the husks come off. So they do a lot of processes with the hands. And uh, we have a we have a note here. Uh, Others say, yeah, you don't want to take any of these the shiva saminim, just like you don't want to take the wood from grapevines and uh, and uh, the olive trees. Shouldn't leave alone leave alone the the, the pomegranates also. Uh, it says here, Bodman, the Das Ram the first Mishnahis have Beita Nasis Beregel. According to Das Rashi, you don't say Beita is done with a regal necessarily. There's that's not that's not proper. Step on it. Well, whatever. That, that's how they have to do it. You have to get you have to husk them. So that's what they used to do. Anybody ever peel wheat? Anybody ever process wheat before? Wheat kernels, grind them up into flour. Recently, my father in law did that. They got I don't know why, but they had an influx of whole wheat kernels. So they tried to make a flour out of it. It was similar to this. My, my in-laws did that. And then they baked challah out of it. I kind of like it. It was very earthy challah, you know, and they made other stuff, made cookies out of this coarse flour that they made at home with the blender. It was okay, you know. There's so much, but you sometimes go overboard. It's like, just because you made fresh bread doesn't mean you have to eat tons and tons of it, you know. Okay. Yeah, so that's what they used to do. All the wheat they used for the menachos took 300 rounds of this shifa, this act of crushing them and trying to separate them. Okay. It's not, I don't think it's a Lush and Guzma, by the way. They used to do this in the temple. Make sure to make it the finest. They have to do it right. The Chamesh Meopita, 500 kickings. Shaf Achat Uvo H. Dayim. It's a ratio of what? Wait, Shalosh Meot to Chamesh Meot is a ratio of three to five. You do one shifa and two kicks. Shaf shtayim uvoit shalosh. And then you do two shifas and three kicks. So a total of uh, three three to five. Okay. Nimtu shalosh shifa v'chamesh b'yitot. Each round is three three rubbings, I guess what it is. I don't know the proper way to translate that. And five kicks. The chozer chalila. And then do it again. So you get it. Three to, ratio three to five. You said 300 and five and do it a hundred times. You really want to peel them well. Get rid of all the husk. So that's what I mean, fine flour. It, it doesn't mean grinding fine. Remember, they translate solace as fine flour. 
But we said it's not ground up flying food. It's not kemach. No, it means get all the husks off, get off all the bran, very white. And that's that's what they're doing basically. Nowadays, I'm sure if we had a machine that could do this very well, they could make a machine like this. Hazal would would be happy with that. Why should you have to have people do this? Thank God for the industrial revolution. Okay, you go like this, one motion back and forth. You can't say, oh, that's two motions, the back and the forth. No, the back and the forth. That's one motion. Okay, then he grinds it and then he sifts it really well also and grind it into the small pieces and then you have to sift it really well so this is what they used to do in temple times to prepare the solas by the way we're talking about menachos so let's say you had to bring menachos to the temple there was a way you could buy there was menachos obviously for the tzibur but we saw that there's also ways that they would provide people with menachos so they had to bring menachos so they'd pay for it and then the temple would provide them with this high quality material. Sometimes people could bring from their own house. They could show, look, it's high quality. But uh, there was a, they tried to make things available for everybody. So this is how they used to do it. Uh, the wine. Hayayin mevi anavim in a What are ragliot? Last week you said you could train a vine to go up a wall and be you know elevated. Nowadays, what do we do? We put up a, a sukkah, as they call it, uh, some sort of lattice that's eight feet above your head so you can sit under it and it's nice and the vine grows there. Yeah, it doesn't make the best grapes. I know one guy, he had a very nice house in the Veda Neal, where he had like five grapevines next to each other. They come out of the ground, there's a pole connects to his house, and each vine has its pole. It's quite nice. Five different types of grapes. Can't do that, for at least for the Nesachim the, 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 the here. That's to be the types of grapes that are, that are low on the ground, and also that are the ground is tilled twice a year to aerate the soil. And they would press the grapes. Why does it use dorech for pressing the grapes? Because sometimes they would actually step on it. Okay? It says about God in the book of Isaiah. God, uh, Isaiah saw God metaphorically coming back to the land of Edom after, oh yeah, what does it say there? It's in, uh, so, it's raw. He's a So where? You know, he like he was wearing such nice clothes, and he's all covered in grapes. I'll read it to you. What it says? The poetic. By the way, it has to do with gods and the come also. Right. It's the last the. Rov Kochal, justly. God is great for God saving the Jews. And they are just. Okay, it's justice. Madua Adom Luvu Shecha. Why your clothes like one who has been in the wine press. Okay? It literally it says, Dorich Begad, get into the, the bat and trample the grapes and make their clothes all red. red.
So sorry about that. We got disconnected. I don't know why. I put the book down. We see Isaiah is talking about the God's retribution is associated with him saving Israel. Sadaka means it was justified and revenge. Okay, and uh, God, so to speak, is uh, like a person whose clothes are all all red because he's been trampling out the vintage. I mean, this uh, isn't that part of the battle battle kingdom of the republic, right? God is marching on. He's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Nice expression. Um, you know the song? I don't know the lyrics. Well, you're you're from the south, aren't you? Yes, yeah, so you should know. Oh, but it was a northern song. It's part. Of, it's it's like the theme song of the War of Yankee Aggression. That's why you shouldn't know it. Northerners know that song. Okay. And I I kind of like that song. I think that there's Christian parts that they can remove. They could adjust it. You know, I corrected it. it says. Uh, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the beauty of his bosom, with, in his bosom that transfigures, not transfixes, it transfigures you and me. So that's Christian. And he says, as he died to make men holy, let us, they used to say, die to make men free. They say, live to make men free. So that's Christian. I don't like that at all. So it's say in, uh, what is it called? In the, with the staff of God's dominion, Moses split the mighty sea. Okay, that sounds better with the sea. No, I'm, I'm correcting it. I'm making my own version of it. I, I don't know. I grew up in America. Proud to be American. Well, I used to be proud. Okay. Tis the law he brings from heaven that transfixes you and me. It's not some, some dead Jewish guy, false messiah, who transfixes men, transfigures you and me. It's the law that Moses brought from heaven that transfigures, that changes our figure. That, that's what he proves us as people. Okay. As he taught to make men holy, let us live to make them free. That's a, that's a more, I think, a, at least even for good Gentiles, for Noahides, that's what the song should say. Okay? It's the law of Moses that transfigures men. It's not the, you know, mm -hmm. beauty in someone's bosom, whatever it is. Okay. Uh, when we all merit to see the redemption speedily in our days and the removal of Avodah from the earth. Okay. Uh, and he doesn't bring from, oh, I skipped something. It says here, he says he uses small barrels, okay? And says also, here's interesting, put barrels next to each other. You have, probably have an illustration there. You have to put barrels in groups of three, right? right. It says here, Don't put it one barrel by one barrel or two in pairs. Ela shalosh shalosh, in threes. Don't, also don't fill up the barrel. You need some airspace in the barrel. So it could, quote unquote, as the wine connoisseurs say, breathe, okay? That's how you make proper best wine when it's time to draw the, the wine from the barrels you don't take the top the top part because it has stuff floating on top you don't take from the bottom because of the dregs the clearest wine is in the middle from the third and from the middle part and from the middle barrel basically you look at your picture the primest wine comes from this middle section of the middle barrel. What you can do with the other barrels? So don't use them for temple purposes. Keep them for your, for cooling. But the finest wine for the temple comes from the middlest part of the middle barrel. What is the being in the middle barrel? Uh, uh, apparently, something happens in the fermentation process that affects the other ones. They produce heat or something. Who knows? Or gases. The middlest barrel apparently came out better than the outer barrels. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So do it in threes, and this is the way they did this for hundreds of years. So apparently there was something to this that 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 wine comes out finer. Hayah Gizbar Yoshev, the treasurer of the temple, he's the one who's in charge of procuring materials for the temple. So he was sitting there. And the wine's coming out the side of uh, the the hole in the side of the barrel. He's draining the barrel to he's filling up bottles or flasks to bring to the temple. Kewan she yir yira shinui. The second you see that there's a change in the quality of the wine, Shinu uh, Okay, because now dregs are actually coming out and they're getting to the bottom part. That's when you stop. He stops taking from that barrel. For Hulin, you know, we take a little bit more, but he has to have a very high standard. He starts taking wine out of the middle of the barrel and he stops quickly. Okay. I'm not calculating how much wine that he wants to stop. I mean, it's hard. I don't know. Not the same amount of yeah, maybe it's also not every barrel. Not all barrels are the same. Okay. So when did when did they bring the wine to the temple? 
Me'achar b'im yom l'drichato. Once it's 40 days after it had been pressed, because now it's alcoholic. Ad shteishanim o yotermat, until two years, or a little bit more. Wine could be two years old in the temple. That's what we thought. The best wine is within two years, 40 days to two years. Hmm. Even though you could get bottles of wine that are thousands of dollars for wine because they're, they say Ahasuerus himself had really old wine. One mentor says that everybody drank wine as old as his, as his year. Now, I don't understand that someone said that once it's bottled, it, it, it doesn't count. It has to stay in the cask or in the barrel. And that's how, that's how it goes. But once they bottle it, you know, less lumba, right? Isn't that how it works? Yeah, I have I have people whom I could ask these questions too. So uh, maybe we'll find out. We may be Yayan Shell. Hold on a second. I'm sorry I didn't put this on the screen. Someone's asking a question. Let's uh, let's pause here. Maimonides states that the Messiah will reinstate all commandments, implying that there will be no change from any requirements in Scripture. How can Temple Mount accommodate the sacrifice of so many people? It doesn't seem possible. Is it reasonable to hold to every statement of Brahman? Yes. The Ram also says that they can extend the Temple Mount, and they. Hopefully we'll see that. They'll extend the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Navi already predicted the extension of Jerusalem, the city, in the time to come. So that's a good question. And uh, the, the prophets already anticipated the answer. Okay. They anticipated the question. They give us an answer already. Okay, next uh, next thing here. V'imhevi'ayin mikamo shanim harezek asher. Who shall we you passe tamo? Okay, you have you passe it or you, uh, yeah, have you passe it also? Okay, he could bring wine that's significantly older. Okay, older wine for a few I mean, years older, as long as it still has decent taste. Okay, how do you check it? Well, how would you check the taste by drinking some? Is it, is it possible? Are He's the one who's buying it for the ah. temple, these are private individuals or. Or even maybe the basin's doing it, just like they the did it, but it's not. It's not nikdash. They don't right. sanctify it and say it's temple property until last minute. The basin has the right, not the ba not the not the temple. If it's hektish, it's only the hektish, and there's meila, and that's temple property. No one can touch that. However, if the basin just says hands off, this is basin's, and we intend to give this to the temple, so the basin can decide who, to whom to give it, or they could sell it for whatever it is. Basin's like a corporation. Corporate Jewish corporate law, uh, at least in the 20th century, is based on the idea that. The halacha already recognizes certain bodies as Jewish, but not people Jewish. It's like a corporation. So the based in and the government are halachic corporations, as is hektish. That's a corporation. It's not a person. So shpita doesn't apply to a based in. Shpita doesn't apply to a hektish. They're Jewish. They're Jewish institutions, but they're not Jews who are bound by the 613 commandments. Make sense? That's why Bastin can do things during Shemitah that you can't. Okay? Bastin is not a person. And you're just the shliach of the Bastin. So that's where the idea of corporate law comes from. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Tisha minim b'shemen. Ooh, you remember this? This is explicit. It says, you don't even need Rav Kapach. If you studied the Mishnah there, you'd see that the Ramah is basically quoting the Mishnah here, almost word for word. word. What does he say here? There are type, nine types of wine. I wrote this in my own here. There's grade, how many different grades of wine? There's A, B, C, and D. There are four grades of wine, but nine types of wine. Okay. There are nine types of wine. Well, it was wrong. Where do, where do you say? About? Yeah, Bashemin. What? Tisha meaning Bashemin. What did I say? Wine. Oh, yeah. Oil. Talking about oil. He's going to talk about the four grades of oil, nine ways to get them. That is, there's going to be nine ways to make oil. And each of them falls into one of four categories. Okay? Nine ways to make it four categories. The nine categories depend on how you make that oil. You could have certain types of oil made different ways, but eventually they end up with the same grade on them. Mm -hmm. They have a way to, the USDA grades the beef, right? Mm -hmm. So here we're going to grade the olive oil. Ketzad. Zayat she gir giro birosha zayat. Let's say you take olives that you pick them off the top of the tree. In this case, the first zayat means the actual fruit, the olive, and the second zayat means the, the olive tree. Uveiro achas achas. You pick them one by one, only the fine ones. Make sure go through the fine ones. Uchtasho untalonasal. You pick them, put them into the, you, you crush them a little bit. Okay? That's what the tasho means after you picked it. And you put in the basket. The basket was basically a filter. 
Okay, the basket holds the olive in the pit and all that, but lets the oil through. It's a primitive filter. Okay, in the Toba Sal, Hashem and Sheatzami Menu, who Harishon. By the way, he didn't put him in a, to a press. In this case, it's the olive is just squeezed by hand. Okay, or just squished a little bit. Okay. Here says you put them into a machteshet, actually. A machteshet is a thing to crush them. But it's not the actual olive press, like the big kind you see. So first squeeze olives, put in the basket the choicest olives from the top of the tree, squeeze them to get start the oil out, put them in the basket, let the oil drip out. That's considered number one. Okay, just put in number one. And then he sticks in the olive press and he puts the core on top. The core is the big beam, the heavy beam, so it really squishes them to get the olive out, the oil out. Hashem and Shehatsam Yimenu Hu Hashini. That's type two olive oil. Im Chazar Achar Shetano Utchano. After that, he ground them up a little bit, really grind them up. Utano Shnia. And then he put the beam on them again, so it presses them, the big heavy beam. Hashem and Shehatsam Yimenu Hu Hashlishi. The oil that comes out of that third pressing is called number three oil, type three. Next. Zaytin Shemisakan Kulan Birbuvia. The olives that he just picked them all together, irbuvia. Okay. Uh, the uh, this is uh, means the pickings. See, they had on lagag, and he brought them up to the roof. Why people used to store produce on the roof? That's where you dry the grapes and and the other fruits. You do things. Why did why up on the roof? Open air and sunny, and it's protected from certain animals. Okay. The chazar uvirer gir 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 gir, and then he goes. And he starts picking out the good olives, picking out, the, sifting through them. Olive, olive. Uch tashan untanon lasal. Then he crushes them a little bit and puts them in the, in the basket to filter them. So the stuff that drips off. Hashem men sheatsami menu hu haravi. This oil is type four olive oil. Okay. General picking, crushed, light crushing, dripped out of the basket. Vim tano bekorah And then if he takes those types, and he puts them underneath the big beam, the big heavy beam of the olive press. And the olive press, then you'd get Hashem and Shiatsa, Hua Chamishi. That's type five oil. Chazar Vitachan, Vitachan Pamshtia, and then he grinds them up again and sticks the beam on them again to crush out more oil. Hashem and Shiatsa, Yenu, Hua Shishi. Okay, so there's basically three pressings of the first type of olives, the, the choicest olives, mm-hmm. hand picked from the top of the tree. Then there's just all the olives picked out of the tree, and there's three ways to crush those. And then they team Shemisakan, and what did he do to the next one? He loaded them up in the house until they start getting uh, soft on their own. Just load them all up, you know. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's process also they begin to to uh, ferment even. Okay? Just just let nature take its course. Then he wiped them. Literally, Minigavan means he washed them off. Okay. And then he starts crushing them. He puts them in the basket so the first oil drips out. The oil that comes out of that is type 7. And then he sticks those underneath the press and the beam in the press. So that's the eighth type of oil. And then he goes and he grinds them again and throws them back underneath the, the beam. A second time. Who wants to see? That's type nine. So there's three pickings. There's three ways you treat the olive once you pick them. And then you crush them. There's three presses. Three times three is nine. Even though you could use all of them for menachos, what about for olive oil? What about for lighting menorah? No. Menorah, it says the first press. Okay. I think the menorah has a higher standard, if I'm not mistaken. Also, by the way, let's say, begin the partial. When are you supposed to light the menorah? Halacha. I mean, what? When it's dark? No, I'm lighting menorah in the temple. I'm not like a candles. Temple menorah says may erevad boker. So Rashi brings Chazal. Let's say you have to put enough oil in there that it'll last all night long. So how do you adjust the wick? The right oil. He says give them enough oil that they'll it'll burn all night. May erevad boker. So when would they light the menorah? It says may erevad boker. So that's the last thing you used to do in the temple service before closing up is they light the menorah. But that wasn't Erev in the sense that it was evening already, because if it's already Shkia, they already closed shop. Remember, temple closing time at temple is like Plaga Mincha. They did the Korban Tamid of the afternoon sometime before that. So you can see here that when the Torah says, May Erev Ad Boker, Chazal called the time of light menorah, what? Ben Harbayim. And sometimes they light it even earlier for whatever reason. 
like the menorah, it says the coin goggles gets to the end of his service. There's no remember Yom Kippur. If he's like Rav Shechter explained, why do you have a machlokus? When does the Kohen Gadol actually do the the Talmud Shail Dainar Bayim on Yom Kippur? It's a machlokus. It seems Rambam describes one way. Rishonim other Rishonim describe another time when he actually does the Talmud of the afternoon. It says no biggie. If he's a youngster, then the Talmud time he's finished quickly. So he finishes the Talmud is what he does at the end of the service. But if he's slower. That, that's the Machlokas. By the way, the Kohen Gadol would finish whatever he had to do on Yom Kippur, finish with the Tumid, and uh, then he'd light the menorah and go home. So there's the whole time he's just trying to get home. So the Kohen Gadol wasn't working in the base of Mikdash some years, all, you know, all, all through the day, maybe even at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he's already done. Okay? So they call it uh, lighting a banner by him. Even the Torah says, Me'erev at Boker. This is yet another proof that when, a lot of times when the Torah says Erev, like it says to Korban Pesach, Erev means the afternoon in a lot of cases. Once the you're getting close to evening, but it's, the sun is still shining. Why is it important? Like I said, with regards to the time of eating matzah, Tosfa says, Ba'erev tochlu matzos, but says, Ba'rishon bar ba'asar yom, la'chodesh ba'erev tochlu matzos. Ba'erev is connected to the next thing. It says on the 14th, Ba'erev. But the mitzvah of eating matzah is on the 15th. No, because it says on the 14th, it means that there's such a thing as Tosefes Yontif, even for Pesach, and you can start eating your matzah if you accept the Yontif. But the way apparently the Rambam holds. Whatever. Uh, so that was just the beginning of this week's partial. You see here, there's nine types of olive for menachos. Okay? So he's going to talk about menorah afterwards. Okay? The standard of menorah is the next halacha. Menachos are reshown in lemali menu. Okay? This type one olive oil, type one, the, the, the right picking and the right pressing, that's in lemali menu. That's type A. The acharaf hasheni ravi, types two and categories two and four are grade B. Okay? Type two is the second pressing of the first of the first group of olives. Type four is the first pressing of the second group. Ushdam shavim. They're both uh, they're, they're they're equal. Okay. Oil type oil type two and oil type four are both grade B. After is types three, five, and seven. Three is the third press of the first group. Five is the second press of the second group, and shvi is the first press of the third group. They're all. They're all one level. They're all grade C. Afterwards, you have type 6 and type 8. Type 6, in, uh, we said, was the, the, the last press of the second group. And Shmini is the, is the second press of this third group. Those are grade D. The ninth type, and that's the lowest grade, I guess, grade E. Well, do you, uh, would you like me to send the table here? Too? No, it's okay. I, I have I have a copy over here in my smaller mock really. Okay, so put it online. So that's how it works. Okay, you could send it. Yeah, we'll put on we'll put on the screen. Yeah, if you send it quickly. And menorah and kosher menorah el arishon review shvibovad. The ones they use for the menorah are types uh, one, four, and seven. Wait a second. He just said for menachis. One is grade A, and four is grade what? Four is grade B, and Shavi is a grade C. So what's the difference? What do one, four, and seven have in common? One first press. Three. Well, it's one module of three. It means it's the first it's, press of each type. It's the yeah, it's the first press of each type. Okay, that was a thing. I remember. There's a the Devar Torah. Does this really hold up? It says. If you're following Shmos at 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 its at its uh, let's say dot okay uh, what's it called face value Moshe Rabbeinu is only told in this week's parsha that Aaron's to be Kohen because in all of Parsha's Truma it says okay assuming Ein Muktu Mukher Batora this is the order it's Moses went up on Sinai and before the whole golden calf thing is happening because we haven't heard about that yet he had first had this whole uh, revelation at Sinai and the you know Nasa and Ishma, et etc. And Billy Mizbeach, and the next day he woke up and says, I'm going up to, to you know, to get the law. I'll be back. Aaron, if we're in charge, Yoshua followed him halfway up the mountain. Right. Fine. And then it says, Yekuli Terumah. It talks about building the temple. And then it says, and by the way, light the menorah. Aaron and his sons shall light the menorah. The most wondering, my brother and sons, why? What, what's special about them? Until that point, it, there was a kahuna already. He was the firstborn. 
And it says, Atah, I pray the as I wrote a chikov, as I told you, we talk to the Oh, and by the way, take Aaron and his sons, they're to be lechanoli. They're, they're being initiated to the priesthood now. Yeah. Big surprise to Moshe Rabbeinu. This is the first time you've heard of such a thing. Don't forget, even everything Moshe Rabbeinu was taught at Sinai had to have been new to him at a certain point. So this is where Moses suddenly hears like, oh, I'm building this whole Mishkan that sounds very nice. Organized worship. What? My brother's the Kohen? And, and, he met, and God mentioned them by name. They have, and, it's, and he told them, matter of fact, he said, they're the ones who are supposed to like the menorah. Why? Because they're going to be the priests in this temple. So that's a big surprise to Moshe Rabbeinu. What was going on at this time? If you read it the way I'm reading it, because right now down at the mountain on the other side, the people are coming to Aaron and saying, no, what's going on here? Aaron's being put to the test. He's being put under pressure. And it says, Shemen Zayich Zach Kasis Lama Or. And that's where Farsha mentioned this halach we just said. It has to be the first press. The first press. The first squeeze. Why? That's that's when the best potential comes out. The, the subsequent squeezes. Okay. Like you only know, you know, said modular. The, the one, four, and seven are the only ones that didn't have the beam on them. Okay, they're the first squeeze. Question is when you're put to the test, you're put in a difficult situation, what comes out? Because I'll say you can tell a lot by man by what is uh, three three casas, right? Koso, Kaso, and Kiso, right? Which means Koso means it's cup. You can tell a man by how he drinks. Sometimes he drinks in, in vino veritas, you know, nichtas yang yet so. You just tell a person the way he behaves when he drinks, or does he drink? Next, how he behaves with his money, his keys. Tell a man by his where he puts his money. And Kaso, when a man's angry, also the real the real the real personality comes out. So too, when you're put into the pressure, like the olive, the olive is squeezed the right thing. Aaron was basically tested like one of the olives himself at this time. Yeah. So I have a little time on this one. Hmm? Well, on the screen, read the salaf that says Katit Lamor, squeezed, you know, the, the, the first press. By the way, so they say that the finest olive oil comes out right at the beginning, right? Makes sense. Ain kosher la menorah, ela yotzi mina katush bilvad. Only that which is katush. Okay, the first squeezing. Val menachos, kulon kosher. For menachos, all nine types are, are fine. And actually, there's and then there's gradations. It's kind of funny. You would have said, so you should use only grade A, maybe grade B for the menorah. For the menorah. But kamash mullah, it's different standards. For menorah, it's one, four, and seven. And even though seven is a grade C type of oil, right? different standards. Okay, uh, let me click on your thing here. I'll put share with everybody. Oh, it's sideways. So let's turn it around. Hold on, everybody. Everybody in TV land. I'll turn this around. Whoop. There we go. There you go. Here's how it goes. There's the first press. Press one, two, and three. Three, four, five, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And whatever's on the same level is uh, quality. So here you have grade A is reshown, grade B is Shani Ravi'i. Grade C is Shlishi, Hamishi, and Shvi. Grade D is Shishi and Shmini, and the grade E, or say F. Remember, there's no any grade things, there's just an F. Everything after D is just, you know, F, it doesn't matter how much. Guy who gets a, a 60 or guy who gets a 40, they all get grade F. That's a Shi. But the menorah uses Rishon, Ravi, and Shvi, the first press of each type. So it's a different standard. Okay. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. Let's put the, the Raman back on the screen. You'll see the halachas. We're almost done. Uh, so wait, if they're all, all all nine types and all all five grades. I said four grades before. It should be five grades. All five grades are kosher. So why do we even bother to describe them? Today, leida, which is the Rambam's way of saying leida, just like leshev is lashevet. Yeah, he says leida. You want to know what's the finest? And what's 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 equal to what and what's uh, inferior? Sherotse liz kot atzmo or liz akot atzmo. In this case, you want to uh, yeah. The word is lizakot. Lizakot means what? In the Bible, this is kind of interesting. 
you ever have, I, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the word zoche, merit to do things, or zochut. That's not a biblical word, right? You agree, Yaakov? You, you, you're, you're certain that it's not a biblical word? I'm not certain. It's, it's Mishnaic and Rabbinic. Okay. But, and it's, it's appeal. Uh, uh, hold on. It's, it's normally is a, it's a pal. And the PL is to give other people zochut. However, the Shoresh does exist in the Torah. Shem and Zayit Zach. Okay? Zach is a similar Shoresh. You could say, no, Zach is Zayin Vav Kaf, whereas Zuche is Zayin Kaf He. But I think like many other Shoreshim, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rabbinicized biblical one. Uh, there's a few examples like that. Okay? Where in the Bible, it's Zayin Vav Kaf, or uh, with a Vav in the middle. And in later rabbinic, it's just a silent hand at the end. There should be other examples around there. I can't think of them off the top of my head. I'm already forgetting in my old age. So that, that's the case. Lezakot means to purify oneself. Okay? Ratzak Adosh Baruch Lezakot at Israel. He wanted to purify them, but we say to give them more, more zechus, more merits. Okay? Yachuf Yitzro Hara. He should, I guess in this case, he should uh, force his Yitzro Hara. He put it to his uh, good use. Okay? And conquer it. The archiv yado, he should be more generous. The archiv yad is the opposite of likmots yad or to likpots yad to tighten his one's grasp on something. Just open up your hand. Open up your hand to your poor brother. We avi korbano min hayafe hamishubach biyoter shebutho hamin sheavi mimenu. It's proper because we're talking about korbanos. It is proper that a person bring from the finest. Okay, the choicest and the finest of whatever species we're talking about that he's bringing. So he's bringing an animal. It should be a proper animal. He's bringing oil. Bring the best oil. Harina marba Torah. What? With Hevel, he vigamhu, mi bechorot sonu melchel behen. Hevel, Abel, when he brought this, the first time we hear about sacrifice in the, in, the, in the Torah, he also brought from the firstborns of his flock, um melchel behen, and from the fat ones. What does it say? Why yisha Hashem el Hevel un chatho. Okay. And God t- s- turned t- with favor to Abel's sacrifice, to Abel and his sacrifice, and or his his tribute over here, mincha. Okay, so mincha in this case is a tribute; it doesn't mean a meal offering because we just said he brought from tzon. Sometimes mincha means uh, what does mincha mean? Mincha means a lot of times a meal offering made out of flour. Sometimes it means a tribute brought to the king or to God. Sometimes it's just the time of mincha, like Ilyonavi. It's at Mincha time, which is the afternoon. So the afternoon prayer is also called Mincha. And uh, this is also an interesting Shoresh. Uh, what's the Shoresh of uh, Sha'a? It's uh, Shin Ayin Hei. Okay? From, uh, it's connected to the word time, but it also means that God accepted something, accepted the Korban with favor. Okay? Okay? Accept with favor their prayer. Okay? Uh, or the same thing for anything you do for to, dedicated to the name of the good God. Okay? It should be from the, the pleasant and from the good. If he builds a house of prayer, what we call a synagogue, so it should be nicer where his actual dwelling. Right, most of us we dedicate synagogue, we we decorate synagogues more than our houses. I would get uncomfortable if they tried to make my house look fancy like a synagogue, you know, a little bit too much, you know. He is feeding the hungry, he should feed them from the good and from the sweet that's on his table, you know, the fine food that he has available. Kisa Arom, he clothes the naked, that means person doesn't even have clothing. I thank God we don't have people who are really starving nowadays, thank God. Partially because of people like here. The Rosh Kolel brings in a food truck every week. Okay? They have uh, free produce for every once here. I mean, demands that the Kolel people take. And if you don't take, he'll come and give you. Okay? They get it. I used to see this in Yeshiva. This exists everywhere. The supermarkets have very high standards. Every cucumber that doesn't look perfectly good, they throw in a different bin. You know that? You get, uh, there was other Yeshivas near where Samantha used to get this. Or the carrots that look funny. The ones that break. Very extra large carrots. They don't. They can't sell them for some reason, and sometimes they break. So you get tons and tons of carrots and, and the ugly potatoes. A lot of potatoes have eyes, so for some reason they can only sell the eyeless potatoes. 
If you just gouge out the potatoes, iron, it's fine. So there's tons of things, and they I don't know if anybody's hungry, it's because they're 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 doing it to themselves. And they also get tons of free clothing. Thank God nowadays our clothing is so pre- plentiful. Do you know anybody who's like, I don't have clothes to wear? Literally you have to sell the shirt off his back. Thank God we don't have that, but that used to be a thing. So if you're giving clothing to the people who have no clothing, you should cover them, literally, give them clothing from the fine clothing. He dedicates an item to the temple. He should give of the finest that he has in his property. It says in Vayikra, when they would burn the chalev on this, all the fat, the forbidden fat goes to Hashem. In this case, go read it as literally the forbidden fat from this behemoth that's offered a sacrifice. It means whatever is considered the fat. You can have chalev pitim, the cream of wheat, and the fattest wheat, etc. You should do whatever you can. If you're doing it for God, it should be the nicest way. Let's go ahead into the next uh, uh, section of the lachos. Brich rachamana de sayon is written in the print version. What does that mean? Blessed is the Rachamon who has helped us to this point. Yes, we're getting there. Maisek Karbanos. How to make Karbanos. There's a few mitzvahs. I made a mistake. I think last time we started a section of Halacha, I didn't read the, the pertinent mitzvahs that the Rambam lists, right? It's very important that the Rambam lists the mitzvahs so you know which mitzvahs we are going to be discussing now. So this could be connected. Uh, it says here, here's, here's the list of mitzvahs. What does it say? <laughs> When has it do the order, the Ola, and then it says here, exactly it's written in order. Okay, There's a way to perform an Ola. Yes, it's entirely burned, but it still has to be done in the proper order. Okay? Notice he mentioned Seder. Shalom the Chol Besar Ola. One should not eat of the meat of the Ola. How they translate Ola it used to be a burnt offering. That's the classic translation, because it's entirely burnt. We mentioned Sansino transit. Yeah, Archgold called it an elevation offering, translating literally, because everything goes up. And uh, Sansino one time translated it back in the 30s as Holocaust. Holocaust. Yeah, remember? Sansino, the, the Hertz Chumish, mentions the situation in Palestine. Okay, Palestine, 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 because that's what, that's what the country was called back then. And he talks about the Holocaust. And to him, it just means Corbin that's entirely burned. Elie Wiesel had not yet to become famous and coined that term. Okay. Seder Achatos, before he called it, what they call the Holocaust, the final solution. Okay, just what the Germans called it. Seder achatos. This is a mitzvah. What is that? It's a mitzvah. And interestingly, normally the Rambam has an infinitive, a negative. This one's strange. It's one of the few that the Rambam says, mitzvah of seder achatos. No, no, is it a lav? It's not a lav, otherwise it would be not to. But this is, you know, do the chatos the right way. Okay? It's interesting because you could really, like, you shouldn't really be trying to do chatos. Okay, but, but the chatos, no, but there are chatos that you have to bring as a tzibur. Right, that not like, for a sin. It's not but, for any sin. But then it would be like at those times bring. Okay, so it should be la sosa chatas kaseder, just like you said la sosa ola ala seder. So it should be la sosa chatas ala seder. Why don't you say la asot? Shelo lecho mibsar chatat haptimid. Do not eat of the chatas pnimis, of, of which there are a few. There are some chatas, a normal sin offering, let's say, the, and or the ones brought on holidays. The blood is put on the altar, the outer altar, like in all the other korbanas. But there's some chatos where the Kohen, Gadol, has to take of the blood of that korban and put it on the inner Mizbeach, sometimes even on the Perophis, right? So it says a Yom Kippur, that's when they do it. They bring the blood of the two animals. They'd actually bring that into the into the Kodesh, and it would get sprinkled in the Kodesh. Remember, Acha, Zakhla, Shushtayim, they sprinkle it in the Kodesh, and Kodesh Kedoshim. So sometimes during the year they do that too. There's certain when the tzibur would would uh, would sin, as the Sanhedrin ruled wrongly with regards to certain commandments, either all the commandments of the Torah or Avodah Zarah specifically, there's special atonements for those, right? So that's a chatat pnimit, and that chatat pnimit is not eaten by the Kohanim. Okay, the chatos of Yom Kippur, stami, the chatos of Yom Kippur, one of the chatos at least is eaten after Yom Kippur. It's a regular chatos, not chatos pnimis. Okay, so yeah, they're, they're, they're interesting. Shall we have the Uh, yeah, a per, there's a negative commandment to eat the chat of Okay, uh, sorry, l- to not split it. How do you mean split it? it means they, they rip the animal in half, basically. It's just a, it's just a bird. Okay, chat of is to be eaten by the Kohanim, it's really good, and then he breaks it open right down the middle part. Okay, but he shouldn't rip it entirely in half. 
Shalui mm-hmm. Avdil, okay? Vishisa Osobich Nafav, Shalui Avdil. He rips it down the middle, but doesn't entirely separate it. Seder HaAsham, once again, there's no La Sot here. Just how do you do an Asham? An Asham uh, is also a type of sin offering, but it's not called the sin offering of Chatat, which also has purification meaning to it. An Asham is a guilt offering. That's what you translate, because Asham is a guilt. Asham who? Asham Osham La Hashem. It's called an Asham because he has surely been guilt, found guilty in front of God. This uh, commandment is that the Gwanim should eat the meat of the most holy sacrifices in the temple. Don't take it out of the temple. They eat it there. We saw it's a question. Uh, Rav Makover hasn't found an answer to this yet. The Gwanim, do they sit down and eat? Because some Allah seem to say that they sit down and they have to eat. They have to sit down. They have to eat in the Azara and they have to eat sitting. Yet Allah also says that Kohanim are not allowed to sit in the Azara. Only Davidic kings can. So how the Kohanim, Kohanim eat the, the Chataos? Were they standing? They had a whole table set up for them to eat. They, they had bread to eat it with and condiments. Had they eat the, the sacrificial meat? Were they standing? Many can't. Uh... Yeah, so that, that's what they assume. There must be Lishka, but the Lishka had to have been halachically Azar in order for them to eat there. But then they're not allowed to sit there. It says the Sanhedrin had a, a, a Lishka, okay? The Lishka Sagaz is connected to the Azara. But they sat in the place that was specifically not considered azara, because so it wasn't sanctified, so they could sit there. Mashma that you can't sit in places that count as azara. Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, let's let's finish this. I'm a little bit tired here. Uh, is another another vero. Shaloyo chilum chutzla azara. They can't eat the sacrificial meat outside the azara. They bring it out of the azara. It's disqualified. Normally, other sacrificial meat can be eaten on Harbayas, can be eaten in Jerusalem, but the, the Kutche Kutchen have to be eaten in, in the Azara. Shalom Yochal Zar Mi Kutche Kutchen, that a non kohen eat from the whole, most holy sacrifices. Even the person who owns the Korban, the Levium, only Kohanim can eat of the Kutchen. Kutche Kutchen. Seder Ashlamim. Rama, once again, Seder Ashlamim. Not Las is Ashlamim, but the Seder Ashlamim. Okay. What's Ashlamim? And people translate now as a peace offering in other words, shalom, but it has nothing to do with peace, okay. And also, shlamim, what's the, the what's a shalem is would be shlamim, the problem of shalem, something whole, would be shlamim. Shlamim is apparently the 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 robin of a shalem or a shalom, and both those words don't exist. So, I don't know what a shlamim what's the, what, what's the meaning behind it. Shlamim means. Some gets burned on the altar, some go to the Kohanim, and the rest goes to the, the people who owned it. That's what General Shlom means. Peace offering? Okay, say everybody gets a piece? I don't know. It's very hard to, to explain. I've never seen an etymological discussion of the word Shlom. Okay? Shalom loch lecho besar kachim kalim kodem zrikaf domim. The forbidden, uh, uh, it's pro, uh, the prohibition to eat of kachim kalim, that means things like Shlomim, Korban Pesach, etc., before the blood has been thrown on the altar. You could say, well, well, let's say someone's really quick. He slaughters his shlumim in the temple. The Kohen catches the blood, and they're handing it to the other Kohen in the cup to bring to apply to the altar, correct? The blood hasn't been applied to the altar. But in the meantime, he's already taken this animal out of the base of Mikdash, and he's prepared this meat already for consumption. So he has to make sure before he eats of this sacrificial meat that the blood has at least been applied to the altar, uh, thrown on the altar. 12. See? Mincha, make the mincha kaseder, but this time he uses long form. Do the mincha as it's described in the Torah. Well, well, it's a little bit redundant. Of course we have to do the mitzvah as described in the Torah. Question. And here he used the verb. He could have said the same thing on the shlamim. Lasos hashlamim kaseder masav haksuvim batura. Okay. I, I don't know. I haven't seen an answer. To not put oil on the meal offering of a sinner. Normally, meal offerings come with a little bit of oil on them. A sinner doesn't get oil on his offering. The sinner's mincha uh, also should not have frankincense. That, that spice normally comes with minachos. The mincha of a kohen should not be eaten. Normal menachos in the temple are mostly eaten by kohanim. There's a part that's burned on the mizbeach, but the rest is turned into a form of bread that the kohanim eat. 
but the mincha that a Kohen brings is not to be eaten, it's entirely burnt. The Chol Minchas Kohen, Lo Seachil, okay? Kalil Toktar, it should be entirely burnt. Shalo Te'afe Mincha Chametz, okay? You have it also? Um, yeah. Wait, I say Mincha, did I read it? It said Mincha, he put a tough here, it's not, it's not the Mincha of Chametz, it's a Mincha, Chametz. Shalo Te'afe Mincha, Chabetz. Yeah. And that's what we have in the printed version. We have a, we have a mistake in the Lachon Mamre. Okay? You cannot make, you, you, it's forbidden to make any of the Menachos baked yeah. as Chametz. That means you leaven them beforehand or allow them to rise. She Yochilu, next positive commandment. Let's say I want to read it in the book. Shilchonim Shari Menachot. Commandment that the Kohanim eat the Shari Menachot. That's everything but the Chometz. The part that's not burned the Mizbeach, the Kohanim should eat. Okay. Next mitzvah. She avi adam kol the rav into the tov of rego she pogago she pogabo rishon. It's a mitzvah for a person to bring all the mendarim and the davos. That means a person volunteered to bring korbanos. You see, promised to bring a korban ola alai or this animal should be an ola and the darim and the davos. So he should bring them the first by the first holiday that hits him. So for me, if I were to take a upon myself to bring korbanos to davos. I have a commandment to do it by Passover. Okay. Shalom Yachir and Yedron Ridoto Ushar Devarim Shu Chayabahem, and not to delay these korbanos that he's obligated to bring. We said there's a Baal Ta'achir kicks in the three holidays. By the third holiday, is already a problem. Lakriv Korak Korbanot Bevesa Bechira, the mitzvah to bring all the korbanos in Bevesa Bechira. That term again, normally Rambam's using Mikdash. When does when does the Rambam refer to the base Mikdash Bevesa Bechira? When he's emphasizing. That place, as opposed to everywhere else, like we had in the first year. To bring kachim from chutzlaretz to the temple, special commandment. Ah, it's an amen chutzlaretz. What am I going to do? You still have to make sure to bring your sacrifice to the temple. The prohibition of of slaughtering any korban outside the azara, even if it's part of the mikdash. Say I'm on Harbais. I'm in Ezra's Nashim. Can I slaughter here? It's too crowded in the Azara. Kamash Milan. They all have to be slaughtered in the Azara. Shelo the Akriv Korban Chutz La Azara, and it's also forbidden to Akriv. In this case, it's talking about burning it on the altar, applying the blood outside the Azara. And this is, by the way, you have to emphasize this. People hear about Korban Pesach. They say, you know, do it, do it, uh, do it at the hotel. No, there's two prohibitions. The guy who slaughters the Korban Pesach in the Kotel Plaza would be hit with the with with lashes, and the guy who would build the Mizbeach there and then burn the pieces that need to be burned in the Mizbeach would also be hit. That's the Hakriv. That's between Lishkot and Lachriv, two separate averas. And God willing, uh, by next week we'll have to learn more of these halachas because it will be uh, it'll be uh, practical. And we'll have to see this now. Good thing we're learning this. We'll know what to do. And uh, don't forget, send your questions and comments. Have a good Shabbos. We have a question, one question got thrown in. Uh, okay, yeah. If we're allowed to extend the sanctuary, extra sacrificial altar accommodation, so any difference what is and isn't allowed. Uh, the second and the first time, specific culture. So the third temple, are there any restrictions on what it cannot be added? Uh, the Navi already describes what, what the what the what the third temple is supposed to look like. Ramam said they built the second temple based on what they definitely realized they could do. The parts that they understood from Mikhaskul, they, they, they incorporated into the second temple, and there are some parts they, they couldn't. And you look in the models, I've seen quite a few scholars have their own illustrations of what the third temple is supposed to look like. None look the same, at least from a bird's eye view. So I, I don't know. I really don't know. Perhaps the Sanhedrin will have the final word about how big the Azara ultimately is. Uh, yeah, third temple, we're not there yet. So hopefully we'll have an answer. I don't have an answer for now about that. Have a good night and be well.